All right, excellent. So, just kind of a preface, and this doesn't <coughs> have an uh, enormous amount to do with the words specifically, at least as far as I can see, the Lord may have other plans. But um, in the coming weeks, now, if you remember, for those of you who are around, last August, last August, um, there was a gap. Melissa and I, we plan our sermons about six months in advance. And there was a gap in August, and we weren't sure what to pray about or what to preach about. And the Lord said, preach about prayer. So for the entire month of August, we just preached on prayer, uh, believing that the Lord was going to do something. We weren't sure what. Uh, but we saw people healed of cancer. Uh, we saw all these other things happening. Um, and the promise, if you remember, the promise that we said was, the Lord, will he will listen to our prayers. He will hear us as we are praying. He may answer how we want. He may not answer how we want. He does answer prayers, though. So think, think through that. And we have another little gap. I'm not sure what the Lord is doing, what the Lord's going to do. Um, earlier this week, I mentioned that we were in Colorado, and um, the Lord just put on my heart uh, an urgency for this month. So I don't know what's going on. Uh, I don't know what the Lord's going to do, but I say this as, a, as an encouragement and a challenge uh, and an invitation to each one of us uh, to press in hardcore, to press in strongly. Uh, we are wanting to go and progress in, in a direction. Uh, we we want to grow. We have to grow um, personally, spiritually. And when that happens, our congregation will grow, not just in numbers, uh, numbers can be fickle, but in our hearts, in our depth, we want depth. And so I'd encourage you over the next month to really be thinking that through. What that means, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a fortune teller. Um, if you're pressing in, though, I will make the promise. If you are pressing in, if we press in together, things are going to happen. I can't tell you what because I don't know. But things are going to happen. Really, really good things. So that's the preface um, that the Lord uh, put on my heart um, as I was thinking through Sunday and, and all that. But um, anyway, uh, 1 Timothy 4. And I'm going to start with a story, actually. So most, some of you, I think, know I wrestled in high school. And I wasn't very good, but I wrestled nonetheless. And um, my freshman year and sophomore year, our coach, he, was, he wasn't bad, but he was old. And that's his own admission, whether for me or not. Uh, and my freshman year, we were ninth in the state. I, I'm from Nebraska. We were ninth in the state. And then sophomore year, we were eighth in the state. And between sophomore year and junior year, my, my coach retired. We got a new coach. And this new coach, he was young. Uh, he was energetic. He wrestled in college. And he could do the things that my other coach couldn't do. He could wrestle around with us. He could show us instead of just saying, do this. And not only that, um, the emphasis that was changed from one coach to the next. Our, our new coach, he, he taught about how everything we did during wrestling season, how we ate, how we slept, what we thought about. Everything that we did had to be looked through the lens, looked at through the lens of a wrestler. And that translated my junior year, we were third in the state, and my senior year, we were state runners up. We went from ninth to second in four years, and <clears throat> eighth to third in just from one year to the next, because of this emphasis, because of our training our fitness levels, everything we did, it impacted us. Paul, in our scripture, he's talking to Timothy, he says that physical training has some value. <clears throat> um, physical training, whether you are you're working out or um, Amanda, you're talking about your friend um, doing rehab, physical training has value in this life. But that being said, Paul urges Timothy to train for godliness, which has value in this life and the next life. It has far more value. And hopefully by the end of today, 
you will see that what that value is and, and see how to do that, feel equipped as to how to get there. So <clears throat> just to start, um, thank you, Judy, for reading. I'm going to reread uh, just a little bit, starting at verse 1 in chapter 4. But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, <clears throat> by means of hypocrisy of liars, etc., etc. Junk is happening. Now, Paul wrote this letter some hundred few years ago, hundreds of years ago, maybe even a thousand or so years ago, um, when Paul's writing this. And he's writing to Timothy. Timothy is one who Paul was grooming, uh, kind of encouraging to take over this, this church, to groom as a leader. And he said, Timothy, you have to be careful because these are things that are going to happen. People are going to fall away. People are going to pay attention to deceitful spirits. Thank you. People are going to pay attention to deceitful spirits, um, evil doctrines. And this is what Timothy is, he, he needs to be aware of. This is what's coming. Now, why do I say that? Because the same thing happens for you and for me. There, if you are a Christian, if you now if you're not a Christian, you can just kind of zone out for a second. But if you're a Christian, if you consider yourself a Christian, <clears throat> whatever doctrines people wait, want you to believe, whatever things people want you to believe, whatever you think I want you to believe, I want you to believe what the Word of God says. Because it's not about me. It's not about these other things. It's about what the Bible says. And the only way that we will stand firm, the only way that we will not be swept away when these deceitful spirits, these doctrines of demons, when this other junk, and that's what it is, it's junk, when this, when this other junk comes up, the only way that we will stand firm is to follow what the Word says. And the method of that, standing firm, is where we come to for today, training for godliness. So I just wanted to say that as a preface, but look up to uh, verse 7. Verse 7. But having nothing to do with worldly fables, fit only for old women, on the other hand, discipline yourself, train yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Godliness has value for this life. <clears throat> Have you ever been around uh, a person, uh, a friend, brother, sister, maybe someone in church, this church or a different church perhaps, and you knew, you just knew that they had Christ in them. They're a strong, strong Christian. Something about them, whether you picked up on it, what it was or not, it was just different from your friends, from the other people that you interact with daily. Uh, I have this friend named Justin. And, and this, this friend of mine named Justin, he has that effect on me. Whenever I'm around him, he makes me want to be a better Christian. He, he's different from my other friends. He's different from the other people that I encounter. He loves, he loves well. He serves Christ well. He worships well. And I know that he does these things because he trains for godliness. He trains to be like Christ. The, the benefit of that is in this life. The benefit for Justin, one of the benefits for Justin, as he trains for godliness, is to be an inspiration to people like me. And I would wager to say... I would dare to say that if you call yourself a Christian, if you consider yourself to be Christian, the same should be true for you. That when you are around someone, when you come near, when this person, when you walk in the room, that they would say, yeah, he's different. Yeah, she's different. He has Christ. She has Christ. They know Christ well, and I want to be a better Christian because they are around. That should be what people say about you if you call yourself 
a Christian. And this is not of our own. This is not of our own doing. Justin, I'm pretty sure, I guess I didn't ask him, but I'm pretty sure when he prays, when he reads his Bible, when he worships, he doesn't do so thinking, well, I want to be this so that Kenyon will look up to me. Or I want to do this so other people will do it. No, he does so because he wants to know Christ. He wants to experience Christ, have great fellowship with Christ. And whatever else happens is just the icing on the cake. I hope, I pray that as you are pursuing the Lord in your Christian walk, that you do so with such zeal and fervor. And when you do, other people will notice. Your friends, your family, they will notice. <clears throat> and there, there's many reasons why training for godliness, why it's beneficial today, why it's beneficial now. First of all, as I mentioned, it, it causes us, it helps us to have fellowship with God. It helps us to have fellowship with God. Think of an athlete. Um, I think I've mentioned before, at least to my boys, um, I know the gentleman who was the silver medalist in, at the 2008 Olympics. Uh, he's a distance runner. And for him to be to the level where he's a, even a medalist, a contender, where he makes an Olympic team, he has to know his sport really, really well. And to do so, to compete at the highest level, to be, well, I guess, second best in the world. He has to know the sport so he can master it. If we are training for godliness, we, well, we're not going to master the Bible. We're not going to master God. But if we will get to know it better. His name is Nick. Nick can tell me more about running than I would ever know. Maybe more than most of you would know put together. I don't know what you know about running, so I don't want to discount your knowledge. But, um... <coughs> He, he runs, and he, and he runs at a very high level. He is a master in this sport. As we train for godliness, we will become uh, more and more knowledgeable in what it means and how, what it looks like in this life, and it's beneficial. Another benefit that we receive in this life as we train for godliness is in our battles with sin. Now, as, as our eyes are fixed on Christ, we lose track of the other things around us. If I'm looking at the piano, I can't see what's going on behind me. I'm not looking. I'm not paying attention. I'm paying attention to the piano. If I'm looking at Christ, the, the sins that I might be tempted to commit, the habits the, the things that I do that I shouldn't be doing, I won't do them because I'm not even going to give them the time of day. Think about, um, think about I'll, I'll pick on Brittany for a second. Um, maybe not Brittany, but some of her friends, the, the girls her age, might say to this boy, don't, don't bother me, leave me alone. And if they don't want to think, if they don't want him uh, bothering them, they're going to think about something else. They might think about their friends. They might think about school. Where we put our mind is what, we, is what will consume us. If our mind is on sin, if our mind is on not doing well, our mind will not be on Christ. It will not be on training for godliness. It will not be on the Bible. It will be on how I can gratify my selfish desires. It will be on how I can get what I think I deserve, what I want, instead of not giving a darn of what God wants. But instead, if I look above, if I think about Christ, if I think about the cross and what He did, I think about the song and the things of earth grow strangely dim. This habit, this temptation, it, it diminishes as I think about Jesus. The benefit in this life today, now, for those of us who we, we consider ourselves to be Christians, you struggle with sin, I struggle with sin. We think about Christ and we can conquer it. We can conquer it.
Uh, Romans 13, 14. Uh, it says, rather clothe yourselves, Paul's, Paul writes to the Romans, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Clothe yourselves with Jesus Christ and don't think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. If your sinful nature wants you to go this way, go this way. If Christ is over here, you're not going to go over there. I hope that makes sense. I hope it does. <clears throat> Finally, training for godliness in this life, it benefits other people. I mentioned my friend Justin. That's a benefit to me. Um, one of the hardest verses for me to accept is 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. And it says, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. And Paul is saying this to the people who live in Corinth. He says, look at me. Follow my example as I follow Christ. Now for that to happen, Paul has to be living as he should be living. He has to be following Christ for him to say, yeah, do what I do. If I'm not following Christ, I can't say to any of you, follow me as I follow Christ. Can you say that to someone this morning? Your friends who are not Christians, your, your brothers, your sisters, your family members who uh, were Christians and they've fallen off. Hey, friend. Hey, brother. Hey, sister. Follow me as I follow Christ. If you can't, if you can't say that to someone else, perhaps you need to do some life change. Perhaps there's some heart issues that need to be uh, mended. This is what we can and should say to other Christians that follow me. I will help you grow. Follow me as I follow Christ. Now, we as Christians, we always have to have this in mind. Um, this is not cheerful talk, what I'm, what I'm about to say, but it's truth. And so don't get mad at me yet. Um, you can get mad at me later if you want. But 1 John chapter 2, 1 John 2, 3 through 4, it says, We know that we have come to know him, to know Jesus, if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. If we say that we know Christ, but we don't do what he says, we are a liar, and Jesus is not in us. The truth is not in us. If this is the case, again, this is just the word. If you or someone you know are caught in a pattern of disregarding what the Bible says, even though you know what you should be doing, your salvation may be in jeopardy. Your salvation may be in jeopardy. If the Bible says to do this, and I say, I don't give a rip, I'm going to do whatever I want, your salvation may be in jeopardy. And I don't say that to beat anyone over the head, but to, one, preach truth, and to, two, say, if this is you, then repent. Or if this is someone you know, show them with love and with grace and say, my friend, my brother, my sister, you need to correct yourself. You need to correct yourself. Training for godliness is good for not only gaining salvation, but for maintaining and thriving. As I say, we want to thrive. We want to grow in our depth. As we train for godliness, we will grow in our depth. We will thrive in the salvation that we have. Think back for a second. Think back for a second. When you became a Christian. For some of you, maybe it was a couple few years ago. Some of you, it was longer. Um, I won't go into years. Ernie, don't beat me up. Um, but uh, think about when you became a Christian. When you, when you did, you probably knew a few truths about the Bible, about, about Christ. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Yeah, that's something that most people know when they first become a Christian. I'm just a sinner, but God loves me anyway. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. You can, you can finish it in your minds. These are simple truths, and they're, and they're truths, and they're good. That when we became a Christian, 
this is how we thought, and that's great. Whether you've been a Christian for <clears throat> a small time or a long time, we are not to stay in that place. Our knowledge of the Bible, our knowledge of Jesus Christ is not to be limited to Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Yet yeah, I'm not negating that truth. What I am doing is giving the invitation to go deeper, to thrive in your salvation, to help other people to thrive and to grow. I hope that you know more about Christ than you did yesterday, than you did when you first became a Christian. If not, now's the time to grow. Now's the time to start pursuing the deeper, better things. As Christians, we train for godliness so that we can grow in holiness. I, I've said it many times as Christians, what is our goal? Our goal is to make much of Christ. To make much of Christ at all times, in all ways. We can only do this. We can only make much of Christ if we are training ourselves to be holy as Jesus is holy. Now, again, something that we're going to be thinking about, approaching, discussing over the coming weeks and months, you do not have to sin. You do not have to sin. Now, this is very clearly something that maybe not, or some of you have never heard. You do not have to sin. Now, let me explain that for a second. <clears throat> I'm married. I love my wife. There is nothing that says I need to go cheat on my wife or I need to beat my wife. Some people will say, oh, well, I couldn't help it. Or, oh, well, things were bad, so I, I had to do it. No, I don't have to do those things. Think about the sins that you may be more inclined to commit than others. You do not have to do it. You have a choice. You have a choice. I have a choice. Sometimes the choice isn't clear. Sometimes it's hard. A lot of times it's hard. You do not have to sin. As we train for godliness, we do not have to do this junk, this, this uh, stuff that we used to do. We don't. As we grow as Christians, we don't have to do these things anymore. And I would wager to say we don't, we shouldn't do those things that we used to do anymore. I talk about my parents. My parents were drug addicts, alcoholics. They don't do those things anymore. I'm not saying it's wrong to drink. I am saying it's wrong to get drunk. And I'm saying it's wrong to get drunk and do drugs and neglect your children. My parents don't do those things anymore because they are training themselves for godliness. You don't have to sin. When you do, when we do, there's grace. There's absolutely grace. But we don't have to do those things that we used to do. <clears throat> so, you may be thinking, oh, well, this is all good, but how? Kenyon, how do I not sin? How do we do all these things? Now, Paul, again, Paul's writing to Timothy. Paul, who's giving advice to someone that he loves, and he's, he's mentoring him. He says to Timothy, train yourself. <clears throat> we've, we've talked about the, the importance of the body, the, the, the larger church, how, we, how I need you, you need each other, you need me, we need each other. And some of these things, I can't, I can't be a Christian by myself. I just can't. It's impossible. That's not how it was set up. You can't be a Christian by yourself. We need each other. But that being said, that being said, there are some things that we can't do for, we can't do for each other. I can be there to help. I can be there to help explain. But I can't read your Bible for you. In the morning when I wake up, you can't have my quiet time for me. You can't be praying for me so that I learn Christ more. 
You can't, do your, you can't do my devotions for me. I can't do your devotions for you. I have to do that. You have to do that. We have to take initiative in our hearts. Now, as important as this is, uh, for us to train ourselves, it's not happening. Perhaps everyone in this room has an active, vibrant, devotional life, and that is awesome. That is great. <clears throat> but in the church at large, in a lot of places, it is not happening. And if it were, if it were, the churches that we see would not be shrinking and dying. Divorce among Christians would not be so high. Reverence for God. Dis blatantly disregarding what the Bible says, it would not be happening if we were training ourselves for godliness. My friend Nick, he's a runner. You can tell, you would be able to tell if he's not running because he wouldn't be in shape. He'd probably have a belly like I do. Instead, he's long and thin, and he looks like he's been running. Nick is a runner. <clears throat> There's a quote I have on my wall in my office. It says, it's from a Christian worker in Iran. And this worker, he says, I have seen people copy the whole Bible by hand in notebooks so they can have their own copy. The Bible is the scariest weapon in the world. I don't think I'm risking much. If I am, correct me later. I don't think I'm risking much in saying that in the United States or in the Salvation Army, very few people have that kind of reverence for the word where, where we would be willing to copy it down word for word by hand. The question we have to ask ourselves is, why not? Why not? What do we need to have this reverence for the Word? We need to get on board with what the Word of God is. We need to get on board with what the Word of God says. Before I go into the practical things, I'm almost done. Hang with me. Uh, the practical things of what it's going to look like. I want to tell you that if this part doesn't stick in your mind, if this doesn't stick in your mind, if you're not ready to engage at this point, ready to jump in, it's not, it doesn't, it's not going to matter. We have to take it upon ourselves right now. I can't do it for you. You can't do it for me. You can't do it for the person sitting next to you. We have to take it upon ourselves right now, today, tomorrow, this week, next week, to be intentional. To be intentional about training ourselves to be like Jesus. And even though next year is the Olympics, next year is the Olympics, and even though they're not happening for another year, all of the athletes who want to go, who are hoping, yeah, I want to be a swimmer there, I want to be a runner there, etc., they're training now. They're training now and they're training hard so that they might have the chance to represent their country. They are enduring great training. And just as they are training that long and that hard for something, that is just going to, a gold medal is not going to matter in eternity. We are to train for godliness. We are to train for a prize that will not fade away. This prize, it will be there for us. We have that privilege. So the last thing I wanted to mention uh, is, to, is to give you some practical things of what godliness, training for godliness includes. So if you're a note taker, this might be a good thing to write down. But I want to give this disclaimer. It's not an exclusive list. These are, you can do more than just the things I'm about to say. <clears throat> Maybe for better ways. For you know yourself, God knows you better than I know you. For better ways on how to train yourself for godliness. You need to seek Christ. You need to seek Christ. He will reveal his will to you. He knows what you need. Now, most of these things, they're, they're going to sound familiar. But just try, if you can, try to adopt a, a new way of looking. Look at it with fresh eyes. Listen with, with fresh ears. If you're doing these things, I promise they'll help you. I promise. 
So the first practical uh, that we can do to train for godliness is to have a specific daily prayer life. Now, praying daily is something that needs to occur. And as I said, I promise, I promise that if you do, you will see results. Uh, there was a conference that I went to a few, or as a teenager. And at this conference, the gentleman, he said, uh, I think he had five or six uncles. And these uncles were bodybuilders. Tough, hardened men. Competing bodybuilders. And he said he prayed for his uncles for 13 years. 13 years. And all of them came to Christ. 13 years and all of his uncles came to Christ. It was slow, but his daily prayers, they helped. They mattered. If you want your friends and your family to come to Christ, if you want your kids, your grandkids to know who Jesus is, pray daily for them. And as mature Christians, as Christians who desire to grow, I want to challenge you to pray for other things, heavier things than just your family, heavier things, deeper things than just this church. Reading through scripture, reading through in front of you is a, a red old songbook. Reading through, you will see deep, deep thoughts and words in there. And the challenge is this. Pray prayers that will grow you and stretch you. Pray prayers daily that will grow you, that will make you uncomfortable. Think about the story of Peter calling to Jesus and saying, Jesus, if that's really you on the water, call me to come out to you. And he said, come. Jesus said to Peter, come. There's a song. There's a song that says, Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet would ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger. Would any of you dare to pray that? That God would take you deeper than you would naturally go yourself? How many of you have ever walked on Lake Pelican or Lake Compesca? Have walked on top of non-frozen water? You know, it'd be, especially if you can't swim well, it would be scary. Or in the, even if you can't swim well, in the middle of a storm, to walk on top of it in the middle of the lake. That's exactly what Peter did. <clears throat> he said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. And the Lord said, come. The challenge, you can grow, you can train in godliness by praying prayers, difficult prayers. Growing mature Christians will do this. Another practical thing is not just to be reading your Bible, although that's important, but to work to memorize Scripture. Work to memorize Scripture. Now, some of you get very scared at that thought. Oh, no, 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 Kenyon, I can't do that. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Psalm 119.11, it says, I've hidden your word in my heart. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Memorizing scripture, it can be hard, but it is worth it. It is worth it. And to train for godliness, memorize scripture. You will become more like Christ. You will learn more about Christ. And you will grow. You will experience him in deeper, more full ways as you memorize the scripture. Being able to think about Scripture in a moment of need can help us from sinning. It can be beneficial. Um, when uh, I'll, I'll pick on Dennis, when, when Dennis's uh, brother died earlier this year or last year, um, <clears throat> I had the the very very great privilege to pray, and we we uh, shared Psalm twenty three. Now, my Bible was in the car, but I knew it. You memorizing scripture might be what someone else needs in that moment. Might be what you need in that moment. <clears throat> now, these are some of the practicals that will it'll guide you. Now, again, that's not an exclusive thing. There are far more things that you can do 
You can disciple someone. You can be uh, a servant in specific areas. If you want to talk more through what that might look like, I would love to talk through that. Grab coffee with you. Grab a meal with you. But if we are Christians, again, if we are Christians, if we are pursuing a, a greater, better walk with the Lord, as Paul encouraged Timothy to do, these are things that we can and should be doing. Everything you do should be focused on that one thing, which is godliness, which is Jesus. I invite you to stand. Let's stand. As we get ready to approach our prayer time, I'll ask the question, how's your heart this morning? How's your heart? How's your mind? Are there ways, are there places in your heart that you can say to me, that you can, you can say to someone younger than you, follow me as I follow Christ? Or are there things in your heart, in your life, that would deter you from doing so? We have the great call, the great privilege as Christians to have fellowship with the creator of the world. And whether you agree with me and see this, this training, training for godliness as something that you can do, I want to speak to you as Christians. Uh, the general of the Salvation Army, he recently said, no matter what situation we face, we must be in the sea with Jesus. Jesus this morning is calling you to something deeper. Jesus this morning is calling you to something better and more full than what you have today. So we're going to pray. And some of you in here, maybe you've stayed in the moan, stayed in the mode of being a baby Christian, that all your faith right now is Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And if so, that's great. That's great. Come deeper. Come deeper. Respond to Christ as He calls you deeper. Some of you are seeking to grow and trying to grow deeper in Christ. And to you, I believe the Lord would have you to check your training. Check your training. Are there areas that you can dedicate and train better to know Him? to experience Him more full? Does it register in your mind that you don't have to sin? You don't have to sin. That's a lot to think about. I don't know what the Lord is saying to you. But we're going to take a moment. We're going to pray. If you would like to come to the altar, the altar is here. And to confess your sins or to say, Lord, do something crazy. Do something big in me. Take me deeper than my faith would ever wander. If you wanted to stay at your seat, you can do that too. We're going to take a minute to pray, and then we'll close. Whatever the case might be, we all have the invitation to grow. We all have the invitation to go deeper with Him. As we train collectively, as we train individually, we will experience Christ. Let's pray.